Hello, my name is Eric Stephen, and I am one of the pastors at the Village Church. The following podcast is a ministry of the Village Church. We hope that it inspires you, that it draws you closer to Jesus, and it opens your eyes to the possibilities of living in the kingdom. Enjoy, and God bless. Father in heaven, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to come and to pray and to sing and to listen and to eat and to worship and to wrestle with what's true. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and from raising for the dead and giving us hope um, of the resurrection, but also hope in the moment with your spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask that as we listen and wrestle with your word, um, that you would uh, give us courage to believe what's true, to be willing to enter into the harder spots of our life, and to look um, to Jesus for transformation. I ask all of that in your name, Jesus. Amen. So, I mean, maybe you've noticed this recently, but Sue and I have been uh, speaking together, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, one of the things that we learned that when you work on a sermon together, it works on your marriage. Um, and so in some ways, there have been small griefs in our marriage as we wrestle through the way we communicate and those kinds of things and how we understand presentations and all that kind of stuff and our own anxieties. Um, so we've been working on that. We're slotted to do that seven times this year. Um, but this time, as we were working on things, it became very evident to me that uh, all I would do would be getting in her way um, and borrowing her sermon. Um, and so she's going to talk to us about what God's laid on her heart because it felt like God just stuck it there on her heart right away. And so um, I didn't have a lot to add to it. I tried, um, but it wasn't what God wanted. So when we answer questions, I'll come back up with her and, we, and, but, and answer questions. But she's going to offer you what God has laid on her heart. So I'm going to turn it over to her to let her do that. Welcome, everybody. Um, today, as we head into this, um, this is the final sermon on grief and gratitude. Let's have a big smile, at least, <laughs> for that. Um, I, and I hope that as you've gone through this process, I've really enjoyed the conversation, both between the speakers in this series, but also just what has come up out of our community this this conversation about grief, because grief is something that we all carry at different points during our lives. And gratitude is something that we're called to live into as well. And so I hope that you have found some space of grief, either some old grief that has crusted over that God's inviting you into a, a transformation with, or some grief that's fresh and current and then some ways of walking into that and also holding gratitude. If that has not come together for you in the past few weeks, then I really encourage you to go back and listen to the sermons and see what it is that God's inviting you into so that you can carry that forward into this next season. Because I really think this is an important aspect of the healing that God wants to invite our community into this year. So as I've thought about marriage and parenting, and the griefs that our community bears in the spaces of marriage and parenting, uh, I've realized that they are really diverse. And every time I look at this, the list gets longer. So in marriage, here are just some of the examples of what we have. Some of us long to be married and aren't, and there's grief in that. Some of us have been married and gone through a divorce. Some of us have been married and lost our spouse. Some of us are married to somebody who has changed a lot during the course of our marriage, and that's really hard. Some of us have changed during the course of our marriage, and that's really hard. And some of us are married to somebody who hasn't changed, <laughs> right? And, and we have the tension of like um, living into a marriage that holds grief in it. And I think all of us who are married do, that we're married to an imperfect person, we're imperfect, there's all of that and more. 
And then in parenting, there are some similar things. Some of us long to be parents and aren't. Some of us have lost children and have lost grown children to death, have lost children, young children to death, have lost children who weren't born yet. Some of us are estranged from our children. Some of us are living with the children with whom we are estranged. They're, and the list goes on with parenting as well. I'm going to grab my water because my mouth is ridiculously dry at the moment. What I came to realize in thinking through these lists is that marriage and parenting is really close to us and each of us have or will experience grief in this space because this is partly because this is a question of heritage and legacy. And uh, having children and having some sense of immortality on the earth, of our life extending, of us mattering, of having a purpose, some of that is connected to marriage and parenting. And then some of it is also connected to other pieces, like our job, our vocation. Some of us may have grief related to legacy and heritage because we're getting older and we weren't able to do the thing that we thought we were going to do. Some of us may have uh, grief in the area of legacy because we have a chronic illness or we're married to somebody with a chronic illness. And so these all bring up questions of, like, what is the point? What's the purpose of my life? What is going to outlive me? And I feel like God really wants to answer that question for us today. So I just invite you to, to consider what is the grief that God's inviting you to hold. It could be in marriage and parenting. It could be something else that is in your life at this moment. And we're going to go way back to the beginning. To the first two sentences of the Bible, in fact. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. Reads, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This is the moment before creation. The next sentence reads, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And then just creation rolls out from that. But this moment before creation starts with the earth as formless and empty. And that phrase, formless and empty, transliterated into the Hebrew is tohu vavohu. And it carries the implication of a desolate emptiness. And we see it come up at other points in Scripture in the Old Testament to refer to a wasteland or a wilderness, to a desert, or to spaces of unreality or confusion. So the moment before creation is this wilderness, is a desolate emptiness. And I think that's the moment that we find ourselves in sometimes when we are bearing a deep grief, that we can find ourselves in a tohu vohu, which is really a tongue twister moment, in a wilderness. And yet it is always in the wilderness that God creates life. It is always in the wilderness that creation bursts forth. And God meets us in the wilderness. For me, in marriage, my wilderness started the day after my wedding. And it was, I was sure when I got married that Eric was the person that I wanted to marry. But on our honeymoon, I was terrified. I was really afraid to be married. And I was afraid of all of the implications of marriage. Eric was depressed because he was also terrified of being married. And I walked into this season of thinking, of feeling really trapped and thinking, what have I done? I just married a person 
and now I can't marry any of the other people. And it's, it's him. It's him and me, and that's it for the rest of our lives. And I felt like my world just got really small. My possibilities got really small. And, uh, and I also went through an identity crisis at that moment. And on our honeymoon, I went and cut all my hair off. And so I came back from the honeymoon, transformed into a person with really short hair <laughs> who was not really excited about being married. So that, was, that began my wilderness wanderings in the area of marriage. We'll pick that up again later. But somebody else that we see in a space of grief in marriage and parenting is Hagar. And I'm going to read this passage again. What Hagar hears when God finds her is this question, where have you come from and where are you going? And this is the question God will ask us when he finds us in the wilderness. Where have you come from and where are you going? And we may be very surprised to find out that where we think we have come from and where we think we are going is very different from where God thinks we have come from and where God sees us going. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. Okay, let me back up a little bit. So the context here is Abram and Sarah, Abram and Sarai have been promised an heir. Specifically, Abram was promised the heir. God told Abram, I'm going to give you an heir who will be uh, become a great nation, an heir that will... Um, through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God's promise to Abram. Well, Sarai, find, no, she's really old. She can't have a baby. Um, and she says, hey, maybe the way this is supposed to shake out is you sleep with my maidservant, Hagar, and she can have the baby, and that's the heir. And Abram says, meh, okay. And so... He gets Hagar pregnant, who's an Egyptian slave. And, uh, and then Hagar maybe starts getting a little bit obnoxious. Sarai gets a little bit angry. Sarai mistreats Hagar, and she runs away. And Abram, in the midst of this, is not protecting Hagar. He's like, she's your slave. You, you, do, you do you. So we find Hagar in the wilderness, in Genesis 16, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Be'er Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So we're going to unpack this a little bit. We have here Hagar in the wilderness, and she enters the wilderness as a victim. She's a victim of circumstance. She's a victim of other people's choices. She's even a victim of her own choices. And God finds her. He finds her. And he sends her. The first thing that happens is God finds her, asks her questions that he already knows the answers to, but she maybe doesn't know the answers. And then he sends her on a mission, and he says, go back. And... In the sending, she is transformed from a victim to an agent of the Most High God. He sends her back. 
And because he has seen her, and because he has known her, she has the capacity to do this really hard thing. And when God sends us, he'll give us something that's not too complicated to do, but it might be really hard. Along with sending her, he blesses her. He gives her a great blessing that her descendant, this child, is not going to die in the wilderness, but is actually going to become the head of a great nation. She will have a legacy. She, an Egyptian slave girl, will have a legacy. He hears her. The name he gives to her child is Ishmael, which means God hears. And that's just beautiful. He sees her. And what's really beautiful about this moment of God seeing her is she gets the opportunity to name God. And this reflects back to the Garden of Eden moment where Adam is about to name Eve and he bursts out in joyful poetry. And we have this little poem that she says, she bubbles up with worship, with joy, as she names God. And she says, I have now seen the one who sees me. And in that little sentence, the word see or the one who sees happens five times in the original Hebrew. It's just this like bubbling up of you see me and I'm seeing you and we're seeing each other. You are the one who sees. She responds with worship. And then she goes back and does what he's asked her to do. The other thing that's interesting about this passage is that Ishmael is the name that God gives her for her son. And when she returns back to Sarai and Abram, Abram recognizes that God has interacted with her, that she's seen the living God. And he hears her, and he sees her, and he believes her, and he gives the name Ishmael to the boy. So she's not only seen and heard by God, but she's also seen and heard by people as well as she carries God's authority back into the space from from which she came. Now, in my own life, in my marriage, wilderness wanders. I think early on, I came to the reality that... uh, You know, once you have covenanted to a person, that's your calling. And I believed that. And so I was able to kind of move back into that space before too long. But there was a calling that God had given to Eric and I to step into ministry together. And I have struggled for many years to fully embrace that calling. I've struggled for many years to not just have one foot out and one foot in to all of the things, to being married. Like, yeah, I'm married, but I really want to have this other identity over here. Or, yeah, I lead at the village, but only in the places that I want to lead in. And what happened with me that actually prolonged my wilderness wanderings is that I wanted to control how I was found I wanted to be sent where I chose to be sent. I wanted to manage the terms of my blessing. And I wanted to have some impact over how I was heard and how I was seen by God and by other people, even by my husband. And so for me, the wilderness wandering has been one of accepting the calling and really embracing it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And I think in the past two years, Eric and I have been married 26 years now, that uh, I've been willing to really listen to God and step into more of what he's calling me into, which is why I'm standing here today, because a year ago God told me to speak. And so um, I think what I've discovered in that just even in the past year, has been that when we will respond to the calling that God has given us, 
that we find out that he's not our enemy, that he's so good and so kind. But when he's sending us on a mission that we're unwilling to accept, he feels like the enemy. But when we accept the mission and we step into it wholeheartedly, he just lavishes blessing on us, and his kindness becomes so apparent. Oh, I wanted to go back to El Roy. Uh, the name that Hagar gives God is El Roy. So if you ever hear that, that means El is Roy, or El is God. Roy means to see. So God sees. The God who sees is El Roy. So in the wilderness, what we're invited to do in our wilderness of grief is to respond to God. And I think there are so many facets to this. Hagar invites us into a response to God that is worshipful, that says, oh, you showed up, you're here. That's all I care about. Yay. And then we bubble up with weird poetry that repeats lots of the same word. We are invited to respond to God in thanksgiving. We're invited to have the conversation with God where he asks us a question, and we answer it. It might not be the right answer. It doesn't matter. It's a conversation that we're having with the God who loves us. We're invited to accept the mission that he's giving us because he will meet us in the wilderness. And as you think about the wilderness that you've been in or that you're currently traveling I wonder if he has already met you and he's already given you a mission. Will you accept the mission? And if he has not yet shown up or you haven't seen him or haven't even been looking or been running away and trying not to see him, would you slow down and recognize that he's there when he meets you and accept the mission he gives you? I think the mission may be something that's really obvious in Scripture right? The New Testament is full of ways to love the people who are standing in front of us. It might be a, like, that might be the mission. It might be take that thing out of Ephesians and go do it. But it may be a very specific calling. It might be something that God told you to do and you were like, no, that's impossible. That's a good sign that it's the mission. And then believe the blessing, Believe the blessing that God has spoken over you. You're not going to see it yet, maybe. It was a long time before Hagar saw the blessing. But will you believe it? It will give you the strength to do what God's calling you to. We see Hagar again. What's really interesting about this is it doesn't get easier for her for a long time, maybe ever. She goes back. Things continue. We don't know how. They are between her and Sarai. And then five chapters later in Genesis 21, uh, Isaac has been born to now Abraham and Sarah. He's the, the child of promise. And Sarah sees Ishmael laughing. And she tells Abraham, I can't abide this any further. You have to get rid of that child. He will not share the inheritance with my child. And Abraham packs up Hagar. This time she's not running away. This time they are exiling her. They are sending her out into the desert with a water bottle. And this is where we pick up in Genesis 21. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. So God shows up to Hagar again in a maybe even worse situation. And then he, this time, he opens her eyes so she can see. And the water is there. And, um, and he cares for her. 
and tends to her and protects his blessing that he has spoken over her. Now, Jesus also starts in a wilderness. And at the beginning of his ministry, the Holy Spirit leads him into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights with no food to wander around and have his own wilderness experience where the Father meets him and he responds to the Father. He accepts the mission. He believes the blessing for himself and for all of us, for everyone who would follow. And then he emerges into the powerful ministry that he has, speaking with authority because he is sent as a representative of the Most High God. And Jesus is in the wilderness with us, walking with us. And the invitation in Song of Solomon is to lean on him. Song of Solomon 8.5. Who is this coming up from the desert leaning on her love? If we will meet God in the wilderness and receive what he has for us, then we will develop this intimacy with Jesus where we're not just trying to do it by ourselves, where we're leaning on him as our lover because we know who he is. And we don't know how long we'll be in the desert, but he is the one who can lead us out of the desert. Some practical ways uh, that have come to mind to prepare ourselves to meet God in the wilderness of grief Um, and that I have seen in just walking with you guys. The first one is acknowledge your feelings. And we've talked about this some during the course of the series. Uh, I think that we need to acknowledge the really ugly, weird feelings. I think, you know, it's easy to recognize like when you're sad and then you cry. But in grief, our feelings get really complicated and tangled up. And we need to find a way to get out what we're feeling. Even the really gross stuff like, well, I never wanted to be a parent in the first place. You don't want to say that to your kid, but you should get it out. If that is in there anywhere, you need to write it down and burn it. You need to drive in the car and yell it alone. You need to pour it out to God. And we see this in the Psalms that David says crazy stuff to God. That it wouldn't make sense for him to be telling anybody else. But he gets it, he gets it out. And I think we have to. I think we have to see what's in there. I think the feeling there's often a lot of guilt that we experience. We feel blame. We try to protect other people from our blame and say, oh, they didn't really mean it. It wasn't really their fault. But we need to get below that to, I really think this was your fault. And relief. Sometimes we feel a great deal of relief when something tragic happens. When we lose somebody, we need to acknowledge relief, even if we feel ashamed that we're feeling relieved. So the feelings that we feel weird or ashamed about They need to come out somehow. We need to acknowledge them. This allows us to stand in a space of forgiveness because we can pour all of that out to God and then say, wow, that's what's in my heart. Would you forgive me? And receive God's forgiveness. This also gives us a place to look at other people and see, oh, that was a wrong thing for them to do. And I will take God's forgiveness and extend it to this person. I think in the realm of forgiveness, there's also some release that can happen that's not specifically forgiveness. Because I think forgiveness relates to something wrong has been done and it needs to be forgiven. But we also have other stuff that we just need to release. With parenting, I felt really intense guilt as a parent for years. And it wasn't all related to doing the wrong thing. Some of it was just, I made a choice. I don't know if it was the right choice or the wrong choice. It affected my kid. I feel so guilty. Eventually, I had to release myself from that and be like, 
that was just part of the story. And I'm going to trust God with it for myself and for my kid. So I think we need to also release uh, some stuff for ourselves and for the people around us who've made choices. And maybe they weren't the wrong choices, but maybe we need to let go. And then as we wait on God, I just think there are so many facets to this. We wait on God with thanksgiving. We wait on God maybe by slowing down enough to wait because we're not really that good at waiting. By slowing down enough to listen. And I think we really do need to listen to be able to hear God, even if we're afraid of what he's going to say. And I think this is a time for remembering Even just remembering, in the beginning, God created. That's amazing. That's a beautiful thing. The first phrase of Scripture is amazing. And there are so many more in Scripture. The fact that he found Hagar. The fact that he finds people over and over again. The ways that he's found us in the past. The things we know about his goodness in our friends' lives. We need to remember these things and hold them, and turn our gaze from ourselves onto God. So, I think, um, I think that's it. That's what I've got. Eric, would you come on up, and you can, you can add anything that, uh, any other thoughts that you have on the matter? I got none. People can ask you questions. Are there any questions? Oh, no, I just inhaled that. <laughs> We're going to take a moment now. Can you introduce the question time? Because I you can't, can't go. Right now. If you have a question for Sue, go ahead and ask. Or if the Holy Spirit is bringing something to mind. Because I love to hear that. Do you think we're in wildernesses all the time, (laughs) just different ones? Wow, that's just such a good question. My life feels that way. My past two weeks have felt that way. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of wilderness to wander. I'm Helen, and I'm a visitor, and I'm David's mom. Oops. Um, and this is my husband, Chris, so I'll introduce myself before saying something. Hi. Well, when um, you all read that passage, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I think this is the hardest passage of the Bible, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> I can't wait to hear more on this. So mm. I really, really appreciate your thoughts and sharing, and I can't wait to go back and read the passage again because it's a passage I struggle with. A lot, and I love the way you presented it about not questioning God through it and all those hard things that Hagar went through. I just love how you presented it, and God is God, and we're not always we're not going to understand Him a lot of the times. We're not going to know the whys, and Mm -hmm. so just thank you for sharing your thoughts, and I look forward to digging into the Scripture and thinking about all these things. Yeah, thank you, Helen. As one of the village theologians told me this week, the summary of grief and gratitude of this sermon series is people sin, the world is broken, God is good, and we can live into his character. There it is. All right, I think that wraps us up unless anybody else has something to say. Hannah. Thanks, Sue. Uh, I just love the invitation <clears throat> that f- from Song of Solomon 8.5, uh, that the invitation through all this, like the gift, is the leaning on our lover. And and I've seen, I've seen you walk this over the last years of like finding pathways to acknowledge your feelings and 
forgive and wait. And I guess I was just curious how you, like, how you've experienced that leaning on your lover. Like, like I kind of see some bubbling up in you, like Hagar, like, I'm leaning on the one who is the stable one for me to lean on, and he's been here all along. And so, I don't know, I was just wondering if you'd speak any more to what that's looked like in in finding him and leaning on him. Hmm. Uh, the thing that comes to mind in that is actually that acknowledging my feelings didn't feel safe initially. And, um, and so to really get in touch with the angry stuff that's in there and the amount of guilt that I felt, how angry I was at people in my life at that moment, uh, it felt very exposing and maybe dangerous even. And that God met me in that in places, in kind of pathways of prayer to say, okay, those are the feelings, but you don't, those, those aren't your actions. And so to say, like to just pray them all off to God and see him hold them and sometimes see him do something about them or show me uh, to be listening also in those moments and into, okay, this is here, but what do I need to do with it? And it would be transformed in the process often. Um, does that answer the question? It does. And I, well, I also, just thinking this too, I think it's a different concept. You know, sometimes we talk about emerging into our calling, but like, I think if God cares about our heart and intimacy with us the most, I feel like the first calling is that leaning on him and then moving into the other spaces, but in a leaning position instead of like, here I am Mm -hmm. all by myself trying to rock a calling. So, yes. And I think that brings us into Ephesians one that says we are seated in the heavenly realms in Christ, who is the ruler above all powers and leaders and authorities. And we need to know that we are in Christ before we can do anything on his power. Um, but we learn that by these wilderness wanderings, by these moments where we experience him and we don't just know it in our head anymore. We know it in our bones. And yeah, and his kindness becomes so tangible. Thank you for your vulnerability your gift to us and your hard work for 24 years. Um, I wondered if you could talk to us some more about your journey of learning to listen and uh, what it's like to battle your flesh in the middle of your fear just so that you can respond to God. Like you're trying to balance holding the honestly the feelings Mm -hmm. and the struggle and at the same time, responding to him from mm-hmm. your gut. Wow, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So I think that, uh, I think probably the way that I learned listening prayer was through Trinitarian prayer practice, which is something that we practice in our community regularly. And so there's an anchoring in God's character in scripture in confession and then just space to listen to the Holy Spirit. And that I think that sometimes takes a lot of practice. Uh, I wanted to hear God's voice for a long time before I felt like I consistently would listen and hear what God was saying to me. And I think holding that in community is really helpful because then we have each other to say, this is what I heard from God. And and to kind of have a sense of, oh, yep, yeah, that sounds like God. Because usually it's too good to be true. Because God is so good. So that's usually my experience is, oh, that was too good. Does that sound like God? And people are like, oh, yeah, that's God. You know, so holding that in community, I think, is really valuable. Um, I also think the acknowledge your feelings thing is something I think of as, it, it's kind of a process of letting them go. Being like, oh, I feel all of this stuff. I let it go. I'm not my feelings. What do you want me to do? And, um, and submitting to God in that space. 
So I think letting go of our feelings is really powerful because God can hold them. We can release them to him. And then he can help us know how to proceed by his power. Does that answer your question? So I'm struggling a little bit with Hagar's blessing um, because it's not all good news. And I'm remembering, you know, mm-hmm. Mary not really receiving all that good news, but both the women responded with worship. And there's a lesson in there that I'm trying, that I'm, I guess I'm not sure (laughs) what that would look like being on the receiving end of such a blessing. Amen to that. I mean, look at Jesus. He faced the grief uh, and the shame of the cross for the joy set before him. And his blessing included a great deal of grief and hardship. And our blessing and our calling may definitely invite us into death and resurrection. Mm -hmm. 